Welcome to this presentation on homeopathy and epidemics. Um, I'm Willa Kaiser, the director of the Caduceus Institute. And uh, we're gonna start by reviewing what Hahnemann had to say about treating epidemics. Then we're going to look at the remarkable history that homeopathy has in treating various kinds of epidemics. And finally, we're going to uh, look a little bit at what's going on right now um, with the coronavirus, with the flu season, and make some recommendations uh, for you right now. And I will take questions at the end. So if you uh, have any questions, just jot them down and uh, I'll leave some time for questions at the end. So uh, Hahnemann addressed uh, epidemics in three uh, of his paragraphs, paragraphs 100, 101, and 102. And basically what he's saying here, um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, in investigating the totality of the symptoms of epidemic and sporadic diseases, it is quite immaterial whether or not something similar has ever appeared in the world before under the same or any other name. The novelty or peculiarity of a disease of that kind makes no difference either in the mode of examining it or of treating it, as the physician must anyway regard uh, the true picture of every prevailing disease as if it were something new and unknown and investigate it thoroughly for itself if he desires to practice medicine in a real and radical manner. So this, you know, just up to here, we can see that um, this is what Hahnemann has always emphasized, is the individualization of disease, the individualization of the person, and never just taking it for granted that something is the way you, you know, was like something else you've seen before. Um, uh, never, substitute, ne never substituting conjecture for actual observation, never taking for granted that the case of disease before him is already wholly or partially known, but always carefully examining it in all its phases. And this mode of procedure is all the more requisite in such cases as a careful examination will show that every prevailing disease is in many respects a phenomenon of a unique character differing vastly from all other previous epidemics, to which certain names have been falsely applied, with the exception of those epidemics result, resulting from a contagious principle that always remains the same, such as smallpox, measles, etc. So certain diseases, very acute contagious diseases, tend to present in similar ways. But most epidemics, um, there's uh, a difference, and you have to always look at it with what Hahnemann called freedom from prejudice, as if this is something totally new. Um, and so that's his first advice to us. Then in paragraph 101, he says, it may easily happen that in the first case of an epidemic disease that presents itself to the physician's notice, he does not at once obtain a knowledge of its complete picture, as it is only by close observation of several cases of every such collective disease that he can become con conversant with the totality of its signs and symptoms. So totality of symptoms is something that Hahnemann uh, refers to frequently and refers to the complete picture um, of a condition. The carefully observing physician can, however, from the examination of even the first and second patients, often arrive so nearly at a knowledge of the true state as to have in his mind a characteristic portrait of it, and even to succeed in finding a suitable homeopathically adapted remedy for it. So he's, um, you know, basically in an epidemic, we want to uh, take the cases of as many people as possible and then get a picture of what that um, uh, epidemic is looking like. Um, and it's good to have people who are young, old, uh, different states of health. But he's saying, you know, if you're really good at it, even after you just see one or two patients, um, you, you can already um, get, get a good picture. And then he says in paragraph 102, in the course of writing down the symptoms of several cases of this kind, the sketch of the disease picture becomes ever more and more complete, <clears throat> not more spun out and verbose, 
but more significant, more characteristic, and including more of the peculiarities of this collective disease. On one hand, the general symptoms, in other words, things that are very common, um, uh, loss of appetite, sleeplessness, become precisely defined as to their peculiarities. And on the other, the more marked and special symptoms, which are peculiar to but few diseases and of rarer occurrence, at least in the same combination, become prominent and constitute what is characteristic of this malady. So with homeopathy, we're always looking at what's unique um, and unusual. For example, you know, let's say I have a sore throat and you have a sore throat. Well, um, maybe with my sore throat, um, I'm, I'm craving hot drinks. And so that would lead to certain remedies like lycopodium, and maybe you're craving cold drinks, and that would lead to, you know, sulfur or belladonna or something like that. So these unusual characteristic symptoms that don't have, you know, they're not necessarily uh, the kind of symptoms that an allopathic doctor is looking for, but the things that are really characteristic um, and unusual is what helps uh, lead us to uh, the remedy. And so when we're taking the case of an epidemic, it's just like taking an acute case the way that we teach our students to do in module one, but instead we're doing it like for a whole group and not just looking at one case. All those, um, uh, and then the footnote is, the physician who has already in the first cases been able to choose a remedy approximating to the homeopathic specific will from the subsequent cases be enabled either to verify the suitableness of the medicine chosen or to discover a more appropriate, the most appropriate homeopathic remedy. So, you know, of course you have to start somewhere. So you start with the case in front of you and then you see, well, are these other cases in the epidemic also um, look like the same remedy? So back to over here, all those affected with the disease prevailing at a given time have certainly contracted it from one and the same source and hence are suffering from the same disease. But the whole extent of such an epidemic disease and the totality of its symptoms, the knowledge whereof, which is essential for enabling us to choose the most suitable homeopathic remedy for this array of symptoms, is obtained by a complete survey of the morbid picture, cannot be learned from one single patient, but is only to be perfectly deduced, abstracted, and ascertained from the sufferings of several patients of different constitutions. So, Again, you know, taking the acute case, and this is something uh, that people who have finished our module one program know how to do properly, taking an acute case, making sure that you get all of the unusual kinds of things. It could be um, the dreams that the person is having, the modalities, like if they feel better or worse from heat or cold, um, what the sensations are like, um, is, is there burning pain, is there, um, itching, you know, there are just uh, so many different varieties of uh, symptoms in the repertory, and all of these need to be investigated, and we need to ask uh, questions in a very open-ended way so that we get a very clear picture of what's going on with the person. So it's basically just really good acute case taking, but doing that over and over again and starting to notice um, the similarities and then coming up with what we call the genus epidemicus, or the remedy for the epidemic. So that's the basic homeopathic process that um, has, uh, and now I'd like to you know, go on and talk about some of the amazing success stories of homeopathy in the past. So it all began uh, back in the day when um, Hahnemann was treating scarlet fever. And a main remedy for scarlet fever um, is belladonna. But what he noticed was that um, three or of the four children in the family under his care became ill, and the fourth, which was you, who was usually the first to become ill, remained free from the disease. And he thought it was because she had already been taking belladonna for a problem with her finger joints and was some, in some way protected. And so later, in a family of eight children, with three already infected from scarlet fever, Hahnemann decided to tr try, try it and see if um, belladonna could be prescribed prophylactically to keep the children from getting sick. And as he hypothesized, all five escaped the disease despite ongoing exposure to their siblings. 
So that's how he learned that not only light cures like, and you can give a remedy once somebody's sick, but you can also give it to prevent them from getting sick. So that was the beginning of uh, what we would call homeoprophylaxis, or um, prevention of disease uh, by giving a remedy preemptively. By the way, uh, the next series of slides here um, I got from a um, holistic health practitioner in Europe called Jane A. Goddard, who um, many years ago had uh, made some really beautiful slides based on um, historical information that is found in uh, Julian Winston's work. Julian Winston was a homeopathic historian and wrote um, an article that described all of these amazing successes. And then she went and made some really nice graphics. So I'm using her graphics in these next several slides. So uh, his success was uh, so amazing that many regular allopathic physicians adopted his treatment protocol and began singing the praises of homeopathic uh, belladonna. Uh, Dudgeon, who was a famous homeopath um, uh, from 1820 to 1904, reports on 10 allopaths who used prophylactic belladonna on 1,646 children and only 123 cases developed. These were excellent results when the attack rates were ranging as high as 90% at the time. So remember, you know, these days, of course, scarlet fever is treated by antibiotics, but in those days, there were there weren't any antibiotics, so the fact that they were actually able to protect that many children um, was quite astounding. Um, Hugh Flynn, the great Protomedicus of Prussia at the time, reviewed all the results of the prophylactic use of belladonna for scarlet fever. It is generally felt that Hugh Flynn's subsequent declaration of his efficacy would be akin to the Surgeon General of the United States recommending the use of homeopathy in the treatment of AIDS today. Hugh Flynn's support of belladonna as a prophylactic carried so much weight that the Prussian government made its use during scarlet fever epidemics obligatory in 1838. So homeopathy really, um, and I've said this many times, homeopathy became famous because of its amazing success rate in different kinds of epidemics. So um, the typhus uh, epidemic of 1813, which was uh, followed in the wake of Napoleon's march through Germany to attack Russia, followed by his uh, calamitous retreat. When the epidemic hit Leipzig, where Hahnemann lived, Hahnemann treated 180 people and only lost two. Allopathic mortality rates were above 30%. Prompt treatment of the disease with antibiotics reduces the mortality to approximately 1%. One un untreated typhoid fever usually lasts for three weeks to a month and death occurs in between 10 to 30% of untreated cases. So again, now, um, you know, we're using antibiotics for this a lot of the time, uh, but this was again, a totally remarkable um, result um, comparing uh, allopathic treatment to homeopathic treatment. This is a cholera ep epidemic where there were 10 homeopathic hospitals and people were dying at the rate of 9%. Um, and in Russia, less than 10%. Uh, Bavaria, 7%. And then the allopaths, um, it was like an 80% mortality. Almost, almost everybody died who received, uh, who got cholera. And then in Russia, the allopathic treatment Imperial Council of Russia was 40%, but again, remarkable uh, results. Uh, this is another cholera, this is a, I guess it's the same time, but another cholera epidemic. Again, um, homeopathy had not as good results at this time, but still people were, um, they were saving twice the amount of people um, that uh, allopathy was able to do. Um, on account of this extraordinary result, the law interdicting the practice of homeopathy in Austria was repealed. So when they saw how well homeopathy worked for epidemics, they took away the law that was um, stopping it. Uh, this is in London. The first time a disease outbreak was traced to a, a public water pump 
and 10,738 people died. This is a huge amount of people in one city. The House of Commons requested a report regarding the various methods of treating the epidemic. When the report was issued, no homeopathic figures were included, and the House of Lords requested an explanation, and it was admitted that if the homeopathic figures were to be included in the report, it would skew the results, so they suppressed it. Typical, right? Upon examination, the buried report revealed that under allopathic care, the mortality was 59.2%, while under homeopathic care, the mortality was 9%. So again, um, and you know, the main remedies for cholera are um, some very common remedies that you, um, many people have in their remedy kits, uh, Veratrum, uh, Album, Camphora, and Cupra Metallicum. This is a yellow fever epidemic. Um, and again, you can see that the homeopaths only had a six, about six to 7% mortality rate, whereas the allopaths were reporting 15 to 85% mortality rate. Um, this was in Tennessee in 1878. Smallpox. This again is a disease that's now eradicated, um, but um, when this was happening in 1886, um, you can see that um, the allopaths uh, lost many, many more people to smallpox um, than the homeopaths did in these different um, big cities. So the average was about uh, twice as many people died um, under allopathic care as the homeopaths. And diphtheria, these are all, these were all terrible diseases that of course now, uh, you know, we have vaccines for and antibiotics, et cetera. But again, uh, allop allopathy had 83.6% people dying, whereas with home just homeopathic care, 16% uh, 16.4% mortality. Uh, it says diphtheria was difficult to treat as dis despite its periodicity, which is one characteristic, it rarely had the same presentation. Practitioners needed to be able to quickly prescribe based on an individual by an individual on an individual basis so that we're able to just kind of give everybody the same remedy prophylactically. Um, occasionally, the disease would throw up particularly definite symptoms, thus enabling the practitioner to prescribe what's called a genus epidemicus or a remedy for the epidemic. Because if you do know the remedy for the epidemic, then people can take it, you know, to avoid getting sick. And this is the really big one, the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, this was considered to be one of the worst medical catastrophes of all time. Um, it was just an unbelievable um, amount of people um, that died from it. It fect affected the whole world almost simultaneously. Um, it was called a bird flu because most flus um, originate from wild ducks in Asia. And in fact, um, oxalococcinum, which I'll be talking about in a little while, is actually potentized duck liver for that very reason, that that seems to be the source of the viruses uh, that come to us are the wild ducks in Asia. Um, so this uh, pandemic of 1917 or 1918 began in the spring of 1918. Pandemics sometimes started in unusual times. And strangely enough, um, the highest mortality uh, was, under, with, was with healthy young adults. And that's probably due to a phenomena called cytokine storm or cytokine storm, which I'll be talking about in a little while, um, when the immune system actually turns on itself. So people who are stronger um, actually have more of a risk of mortality of dying. So the second wave in late summer of 1918 was the most lethal and half a million Americans died, 500,000 Americans died um, of this flu. Now every, this season, for example, this flu season, 20,000 people have already died. We don't even know about that. Uh, we don't even think about it because we're just kind of used to it. And one thing that does happen is when a threat is new or something is new, we overreact to it 
Whereas um, when something is with us all the time, we tend to underreact because you know we just it just kind of goes into the background of our consciousness and we're not thinking about it so much. Um, then there was a third wave in uh, 1919. The worldwide de uh, death rate was 40 million people that died um, from this flu. Um, pandemic, uh, the, by the definition of pandemics, they, they usually, they can affect up to 25 to 35 percent of the population. So a lot of people really get sick. So with today's population, if a similar pandemic happened, um, that would mean like 180 to 360 million people could, pass, could die worldwide and 1.7 million people just in the U.S. So um, what happened is that particular disease had a short incubation period, um, chills, fever, and delirium within hours. Death could occur within 12 to 18 hours of symptoms appearing, very high temperatures, big uh, hemorrhaging, discharges from the lungs um, and nose. They called it the purple death because people turned purple from lack of oxygen. Um, so um, basically it's now being thought that a lot of people probably died from what's called the cytokine storm, which I will be showing you a picture of, which causes um, um, basically death by suffocation because your lungs fill with fluids and the organs fail, et cetera. Um, so those are some uh, details about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. And again, you can see the um, rates of um, uh, survival um, out of 24,000 cases of flu treated allopathically, 28.2% people of people died while 26,000 cases of flu treated homeopathically had a mortality rate of 1.05%. This is just totally amazing. Um, so uh, one of the reasons the allopaths may have lost so many people is, um, as sometimes happens, um, their medicine may have actually made people worse because they uh, were giving things like aspirin that, um, you know, may have caused more problems and done more harm than good. So that's one uh, possibility. We don't know, of course, for sure. So this is the cytokine storm. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details. I don't remember all of my uh, microbiology and all that kind of stuff anyway. But basically, uh, it's an immune response. Uh, that happens when the body is feeling very overwhelmed and when they're um, infected by certain kinds of viruses. And so they overproduce um, immune cells and they're activating compounds, the cytokines, which um, then causes um, activated immune cells in the um, lungs and then the capillaries leak, you can see, and then uh, it can relate, it can cause multiple organ failure. Um, and so uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is called ARDS, you'll see it called ARDS. So that's often what people uh, die of um, when their immune system just goes haywire and uh, causes these problems. So this is one reason um, we may not want to give a uh, very strong immuno, um, immuno stimulating herbs. Uh, if somebody is, especially if somebody is already sick, because we don't want their um, immune system to actually go into overdrive. You know, it's good to take things that may support your immune system in general, but if you're already kind of getting sick, whether it's a good idea to continue uh, immuno stimulating um, herbs is a question to think about. So uh, going on to other diseases here, meningitis uh, in Brazil, this was in 1974. 18,640 patients were given um, the no sod you know, the homeopathic remedy made from the disease. Um, while 6,430 received no treatment, the treatment group had four cases and there were 32 cases in the no treatment group. So it was 23 times more effective than no treatment. 
So this was just a very, very simple prescription, taking the meningitis no sode, giving it to 18,000 people, it's a lot of people, and it protected them. Polio was also um, used. Uh, actually, the remedy that was used um, was not um, polio, it was called lathyrus. Uh, that was used as the, um, uh, to prevent polio in South Africa. And then uh, Grimmer, a famous homeopath, uh, gave um, 5,000 children homeopathic lathyrus with 100% efficacy. No one got any side effects. And then uh, another homeopath between 1956 to 1958 um, gave another 6,000 children. So these are very large uh, amounts of, I don't, of reaching a lot of people and protected people from polio. Again, we now um, have a vaccine for it and most people are vaccinated. Uh, Lathyrus was given to 30 to 40,000 people. Um, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and nobody got polio there as well. So this was another uh, way of preventing, um, during a polio outbreak, preventing uh, children from getting sick. So now we're looking at this novel coronavirus. This is uh, a picture of it. Uh, it's called corona because it kind of supposed to look like a crown. I've done lots and lots of reading about this, and the conclusion is that there's really no conclusion. Um, some uh, sources are claiming that there is a 2% mortality rate, which is much higher than the normal flu. So if a lot of people got it, a lot more people would die um, than um, would die from the flu. But it's also been pointed out that most of this information is coming from China, and China is probably underreporting the amount of cases. And if they're underreporting the amount of cases, that would mean the mortality rate is actually lower um, than 2%. So we don't know how dangerous this um, virus is yet. It may be more dangerous than a regular flu virus, or it may not. Um, so uh, there's the president of the Hong Kong Association, sorry, Hong Kong Association of Homeopathy um, says that he has gathered data from 30 homeopaths who've been treating coronavirus in the past 14 to 21 days. This came out just a few days ago. But they're not really differentiating between <laughs> the flu and the coronavirus. Uh, they're just lumping it all together. You know, people come in, they're sick, they don't know what they've got. But what they're seeing is um, gelsemium. Um, I've also heard it's got a kind of slow onset, unlike um, the epidemic in 1917. By the way, the main remedy for the epidemic in 1917 was also gelsemium. I'm not sure why, since it seems like it had a quick onset. Gelsemium is known for slow onset. Um, but there must have been some other symptoms that matched because that was the genus epidemicus, the main one um, in the 1917 flu epidemic. So gelsemium, main symptoms are fatigue with heavy eyelids, cough that is not uh, that predominant. And I'll be going a little bit more into these remedies in a little while. Rhyonia for patients with more cough, pain in the chest or head. Patient holds their chest with their hands when coughing, like, you know, move the movement of the chest hurts. And ubitorium perfoliatum, uh, when patients complain of bone pain and less heavy, but uh, having bone pain. So they were recommending gelsemium once, uh, 30C once a week in areas in which the outbreak isn't near and uh, gelsemium 30D, 30C daily for seven days in an area where the outbreak is near, like Wuhan or some other crowded cities, then twice per week. So that's a pretty intensive protocol. Um, uh, but, you know, if you, uh, I wouldn't myself take gelsemium prophylactically unless I really felt that I was getting exposed uh, to a flu or some kind of virus. So a really good resource um, for uh, information on epidemics every year is Paul Hershkew, um, who's a homeo homeopath that writes a blog every year and really tracks you know, what the remedy, what remedies are being used for the flu. Um, 
and he has a very reasonable approach. I was just uh, in preparation for this presentation today. I was just reviewing everything he was talking about this year. And one of the things he pointed out, which is exactly where, how I feel, um, is that for some reason, I guess it's fear or panic, you know, people are just all over the place with wild guesses right now. <clears throat> and uh, not following the steps that we know work. And, you know, that's why I, the first thing I did here was review what Hahnemann actually said and the results that he got by following those. So we need to be methodical, we need to be patient, um, we need to take care of ourselves. And so I'm gonna talk about all of that too. But meanwhile, if you want to um, subscribe to Paul's uh, blog, um, or you can just uh, stay in touch with me if you're on my list, because I'll always be sending out to my list. So he he's feeling like he's seeing a lot of gelsemium, um, uh, also gelsemium flus in the U.S. So he's seeing the similar thing to the Hong Kong people that um, that gelsemium is the remedy that seems to be coming up. He also thought bryonia um, is an important remedy, just like the Hong Kong. Um, homeopaths, belladonna, which is often given, you know, in high fevers with a lot of ref, um, redness and inflammation. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, a, a um, part of the Indian government, some agency of the Indian government came out with a recommendation um, of Ayurvedic uh, protocol, uh, which looked great. I mean, I don't know much about it, but they came out with an Ayurvedic herbal protocol that he, they thought would be good for people and the homeopathic remedy arsenicum. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that they were prescribing arsenicum. And I mean, they didn't give any explanation as to why, um, but um, for me, I feel like we're all in, a, in kind of an arsenicum state around this, you know, this uh, fear of the unknown, feeling like things are out of control, um, and kind of being in an anxiety state where everything just seems to be spinning into chaos and not knowing uh, what's going on. That's very much of an arsenicum state. <laughs> and so I really felt like when they said arsenicum, it was like, well, maybe all the homeopaths need some arsenicum because they're just kind of stabbing it, you know, just throwing out ideas without any, any basis for them. Um, there is a wonderful um, homeopath, uh, and I forgot to put it on the slide, uh, Dr. Master uh, pointed out another interesting remedy that might just be a good one to keep in your kits. Um, I have it in one of my kits because um, I have some kits from India, but it's called Justica Adhadota, um, and it's highly efficacious medicine for acute catarrhal conditions of respiratory tract used in the beginning. So he was uh, prescribing it uh, prophylactically <clears throat> for people to take it prophylactically. It's supposed to be as a preventative for these kind of respiratory uh, problems and is used a lot in India. So Justica, J-U-S-T-I-C-I-A, Justicia, I guess, something like that. The Malabar nut is the common name. So anyway, um, another thing that Paul Hershew says is of course, a person's constitutional remedy. And of course, when people are on constitutional homeopathy, they usually don't get sick at the same rate that everybody else does. They, their immune systems are stronger and they do better. So constitutional prescribing is definitely something if you're not on a constitutional remedy, you might want to get in touch with a homeopath and uh, get, uh, uh, get on a good remedy. And then as I mentioned uh, being earlier, being careful with immunostimulating herbs if you're already sick um, because of this danger of a cytokine storm. Okay, so gelsemium. Um, you know, I, I strongly suggest if um, you're concerned about these kind of things, and I think it's reasonable to have some concern. We're, it, we're living in a very um, crowded, stressful, uh, polluted world, and um, epidemics are something that happen. Uh, so being prepared by um, having remedy, having a good remedy kit with these remedies in it, is probably a good idea, along with some other kinds of preparations you can make, which I'll talk about in a moment. 
So uh, the gelsemium state, gelsemium is um, actually a jasmine flower and uh, a gelsemium flu will often start out kind of slowly. You feel a little dull, you feel a little out of it, um, weak. There can be trembling, drowsiness. Uh, some of the other keynotes are chills running up and down the spine. There can be a headache like a band that feels like a band. A uh, person may be thirstless, but feel better after clear copious urination. Can come on after excitement. So after getting overexcited and about something, then going into this kind of dull state. And as I mentioned, the slow onset and can come on in the spring or in humid weather. So it's our most common flu remedy um, and good one to keep on hand in maybe 30C and 200C potency. Eupatorium perfoliatum, which I had mentioned earlier, is bone set. And the main keynote in terms of flu is when you have these really deep bone aches. There may be thirst, the eyeballs may be sore, hoarseness and soreness of the chest, and there may be some relief from the pain from getting up on the hands and knees. Bryonia is the grouchy bear remedy. Um, it's uh, being irritated by any kind of movement or motion or anything moving. Um, very dry, thirsty for cold drinks of water, large drinks of water. Um, bursting headache, worse from getting too warm, feeling better from pressure and a kind of general irritability, not wanting to be disturbed. And don't forget oxylococcinum which um, is a great thing to take when you feel like any kind of viral condition might be coming on. Um, Oxylococcinum, uh, as I said, is uh, potentized from the livers of ducks in Asia because that is actually um, where um, most of our respiratory uh, flu kinds of viruses come from. Um, according to epidemiology. So they potentize it and uh, that is a great preventative of um, flu. So keeping, keeping it on hand and taking it. By the way, you get these tiny little um, bottles, but you'd only, and they kind of make it as if one dose is all of the, that whole sugar, sugary, sugar pellet bottle. But really, you can just take a few of those pellets. You don't need to take the whole tube. You can, you know, use a lot less medicine uh, because it's the potency that matters, not the amount of those little white pellets that you're taking. So just take a few of them and uh, it will last a long time. <laughs> So uh, let's talk a little bit about prevention. Ma those masks that you see everybody watched wearing on TV, they don't really do anything. They get wet from you breathing on them all the time and they're just not a good idea um, in general. But uh, one tip I, I read about from somebody who does a lot of traveling and spends a lot of time covering, I mean, you're a journalist who covers epidemics, she wears gloves when she's out. So, you know, you could wear gloves, you know, because you're touching all the time, whatever, doorknobs, shopping carts, etc. Or just be really good about using hand cleansers. But while you're out, don't touch your face. Don't, don't do this. Don't touch around your um, face, your eyes, your ears, because the virus can actually uh, go in that way. You can you know, touch something, get the virus, and then put it on, you know, put it on your face, and that's how it gets in. Uh, vitamin D levels, make sure your vitamin D levels are, um, are way above the reference range. Uh, the normal reference range is something like 30, but they should be at least 50. Um, most people need to supplement vitamin D, and vitamin D will strengthen your immune system quite a bit. Make sure you eat enough protein and regular meals and have healthy fats in your diet. Uh, mood follows blood sugar. So if you're you know, stressed out and just eating a bunch of carbs and then crashing and eating a bunch of carbs and then crashing, um, the, that could really weaken your immune system. It's a good way to get sick is by uh, just going into this uh, carbohydrate cycle. So try not to do that. Uh, try to make sure there's enough protein and healthy fat in your diet. In fact, I have other presentations about 
um, self-care during traumatic times and things like that on my, on my YouTube channel where I go into more detail about adaptive genic herbs, um, about um, food recommendations, things like that. Uh, so you can go to my YouTube channel and check out some of that information as well. And just, of course, um, doing things that uh, put more spaciousness and relaxation into your life, um, such as whether it's praying, meditating, relaxing, uh, focusing on your breath, spending some time out in nature uh, with your pets, with your animals, uh, get away from the screen, <laughs> the computer screen, and just tune into your own um, state of inner peace. So if there is an epidemic, just to be ready, um, I don't suggest taking remedies prophylactically when, you're, when you don't need them. I, I think that's a bad idea, actually, um, because then when you do need them, they may not be as effective. But, you know, to keep oxylococcinum around, there's an influenzinum nosod as well, gelsemium. Um, keep them around in 200 uh, C potency. Take, you could take, if there was a bad flu epidemic or some kind of viral epidemic um, in your community, you could take oxylococcinum once a week and influenzinum once a week on different days. Uh, keep track of what homeopaths are saying by being, um, you know, may, being subscribing to my newsletter or um, check out uh, Paul Hershkew's blog. And again, keep yourself healthy in a holistic way with um, homeopathy, maybe having your constitutional case taken, um, and uh, traditional Chinese medicine, yoga, meditation, et cetera. And you know, having, um, having food and everything that you need at home so that you don't need to be running out if there are a lot of people sick out there, just you know, stay home by the fire. Um, and uh, stay peaceful, um, and that's another good way not to get sick. So that's what I had to share today, and now I'm going to invite you to, I, I think what I might do is unmute everybody, just because you may not know how to unmute, and see if anybody has any questions. Oh, you're, I'm really having trouble hearing you. Can you speak up, please? Yeah, I'm not hearing. Okay, well, everybody, thank you for joining me. Does anybody have a question who's unmuted? Hi, Willa, it's, it's Risa. Hi, Risa. Willa, why would one, ha why would one have a constitutional, and do constitutionals change? If I don't have a constitutional, why would I get one or have one? Oh. Is it because I, do I get one when I'm sick or do I just um, come in and say, hi, I want a constitutional? Well, most people have some kind of chronic health condition going on. So <laughs> if they do, um, by getting a, um, constitutional remedy, then it can be a way, you know, to be healthier with the chronic things that are going on and also increase your immunity as part of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very few people don't have any other health problems. Um, the constitution so, change. Well, <clears throat> the remedy, the remedy people need may change, you know, over time, um, there's, you know, some, some people need the same remedy over decades and other people, things happen or other health issues come to the front <clears throat> and they need a different remedy. So you can't really predict. Um, the best way to know is if you take the remedy that was prescribed for you before, if it helps you with the, with the uh, con condition that you were treating before, uh, then you know that's still a good remedy for you. But um, other than that, um, most people most people probably need a new remedy after a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you take constitutionals all the time or once or? 
Well, I, I personally prescribe LM potencies, which are um, water remedies that people take on a daily basis. Um, oh. Although if people, um, you know, don't have health problems that are bothering them and don't need to take a remedy every day, it's possible to take a single dose, of like a 200 or something like that. Thanks, Willa. Okay, then I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question? All right. Well, thank you all. I'm just going to mute everybody for a minute. Um, thank you all for joining me and uh, hope you stay healthy this season and uh, do be in touch with me if you have any other questions. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you, Willa. Bye-bye.